All right, thank you. Uh, I, I was just reflecting there, and I, I think I received a telepathic message from Cynthia ceding me her time. <laughs> so uh, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> uh, this, is a, this is a collaborative effort with, uh, with three colleagues, uh, Sebastian Reicha, Mark Mendenhall, and uh, Joyce Osland, and grew out of a, uh, a previous effort, uh, an article that we published last year called uh, Defining the Global in Global Leadership, which was an effort to better understand the context in which global leaders were leading, which was the global. And we were surprised at the time to discover that nobody had really spent much time or invested much effort in defining what they meant by global. Uh, and so that led to that article. And as we came out of that, uh, that effort, we were reflecting on, uh, on the field in general, the, the, the field of global leadership, if we want to call it a field. Oh, old slides. OK, these were not the slides I had sent in originally. <coughs> uh, <coughs> We're missing. That's fine. We're good. We'll live. <coughs> Besides, I have lots of time. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, uh, what we discovered, the field of global leadership uh, really emerged. The first articles began to appear in 1993, so we have about 20 years. And as we looked through and reviewed uh, a lot of the literature, increasingly there are more empirical studies, uh, more theoretical work, uh, what we discovered is that there was widespread disagreement about what we meant when we said global leader. Uh, and indeed, a great deal of argument and criticism. And of course, uh, <clears throat> that, that suggested an opening for us to step in. One of the problems when pit fields are poorly defined, often uh, using the metaphor of a garden, they, uh, they become more like a weed patch. Uh, with, uh, with competing definitions, and then consequently it's difficult to move the field forward because there's no agreement on what it is we're talking about. Uh, we measure different things using different types of rulers, and, um, and then we complain that nobody understands what we have to say, and we complain that nobody is able to do things. And so we, we thought we would wait in. Um, there are definitional differences. We put together, and in the interest of time, I won't go through, but we, we pulled together all of the definitions that we could find and began to sift and sort and look for patterns and themes. Um, we noted that the, the lack of definitional coherence led to a real absence of, of theoretical perspectives. That is, there were kind of feints and attempts, but, uh, but not much follow through. And uh, consequently, it was also difficult to specify what exactly the, the, the domain of global leadership was. How, how could we differentiate that from other fields of inquiry? Uh, so what we sought to do with this taxonomy that we've developed is, as we suggest, develop some conceptual building blocks that would allow us to study it more rigorously and move the field forward, that would provide some contextual texture uh, by which I think Sebastian came up with that term. Uh, he meant that there would be some things that we could work with, some, uh, some things we could wrap our arms around uh, rather than just uh, continue to throw jello against the wall. Uh, <clears throat> it would also allow us to contribute to other literatures, and I pointed out the expatriation literature because it's quite extensive, but other literatures like leader member exchange theory, and even more broadly uh, in strategy, and, uh, and international business research in general, I think our perspective has some things to offer. And lastly, we could, uh, we could make this translatable. Uh, that is, we could apply it and understand the challenges that leaders themselves confront and help them better able to uh, uh, think about and identify ways to move forward in their, in their leadership efforts. <clears throat> So as we looked at this, and, and if you're careful, you'll realize that what we have done is identified it two by two, therefore making us legitimate social scientists. Uh, uh, two, two broad dimensions. One, a, con, uh, a contextual dimension, which has to do with what we call environmental complexity, and then the response, how do leaders lead within that context, a relational dimension, which we call flow. And uh, I'll... Uh, See if I can't uh, unpack those a little more extensively. Uh, under the contextual, we have diversity, interdependence, and flux. That is three subfacets or three dimensions. 
And then under the relational, we have boundary spanning, relational depth, and influence. So let me talk about complexity first. Um, these three dimensions, um, we often have a tendency to talk about globalization. What we really mean is extreme complexity is characterized by, uh, by diversity, interdependence, and flux. And the characteristics of that are a combination for diversity is a, a quantity and a range of different environmental conditions. It's not just that there's a lot out there, but there's extremely diverse, um, diverse competitors, diverse business models, uh, diverse people and institutional settings that we're working in. That would be challenging in and of itself, but there is interdependence, complex relationships um, uh, among them. We know that firms often are competitors, collaborators, and customers of one another which make things complex. And then finally, there is flux, the degree of environmental change, which is destabilizing. And we can measure that in different ways in terms of the frequency of change, the intensity of change, and the, the extent to which we can predict. Um, <clears throat> that's the context. How do leaders respond? Well, they appear to respond across three dimensions, one being boundary spanning. Indeed, if there's something that clearly distinguishes what we typically have characterized global leaders as, as being different from domestic leaders, it is the nature of boundary spanning. And indeed, until we began to study boundary spanning, there is no mention, uh, astoundingly, no mention in the leadership literature in general of the concept of boundary spanning. Uh, which we define in two ways, both as a structural and geography, that's kind of the more obvious one, but also in terms of the roles and identities that leaders are required to adopt in order to span those boundaries. Second aspect of this is a relational depth. How much contact, how much involvement do you have with other people? Um, this is influenced by asynchronicity, the fact that we are in different times in different places. It's also by the frequency of interactions, how frequently we interact with people. Uh, some leaders may do so on a daily basis, others uh, less frequently. That has an impact on that relationship or the flow of information, the flow of, uh, of knowledge that passes back and forth. And last, and this uh, third under relational depth is also intensity, a minor typo here, which is why I send in new slides. Um, <clears throat> the intensity, how, uh, how close is that relationship? The, the final aspect or the final subdimension of flow is, is called influence and has to do with psychic distance and what we might call social fiction. The ability to use those relationships and what passes back and forth between those relationships to, act, to actually affect change. What we do within the context of this manuscript is, is work through and, and detail specific operationalization. So someone can take a concept like, like boundary spanning and use specific measures to, uh, to address this. Um, <clears throat> Having done that, uh, we think there's tremendous potential for where the field can go, and we also see this as having potential to affect other fields, uh, <clears throat> which is how we hope to get lots of citations. Thank you for your time. <laughs>